Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Hello and welcome, dear saints of St. Peter Evangelical Lutheran Church, as well as all of our dear brothers and sisters in Christ who are joining us here today. Well, today is Tuesday, which means that it's time for us to study a uh, book of the Bible here today. Now, if you remember last week, we finished up our study of the book of Haggai, a uh, wonderful study there that we got uh, finished up last week. And I told you we'd be starting a new book today, and that book that we'll be starting is the book of Titus. And so we're really looking forward to jumping back into the epistles, to the epistle of Titus, uh, and seeing what our Lord has to tell us there in that wonderful epistle. And so we look forward to that today. And then looking ahead here just in the next two days, uh, tomorrow we will do our hymn of the day study for the hymn for this upcoming Sunday, and that hymn is Christ is the World's Redeemer. Now, I forgot to write down the number today, but it will be the hymn Christ is the World's Redeemer, a beautiful hymn, and we'll see the great joy that that hymn brings us on uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And then Thursday, uh, we will finish up the baptism section of the large catechism. We'll kind of wrap it all up, uh, and, and really in a most marvel marvelous way. As Luther ends the, the really the discussion of holy baptism uh, by really bringing us back to the cross, bringing us back to where we are joined, to Christ, to his death, and to his resurrection. So we look forward to that on Thursday. Uh, and then one other note uh, as we look ahead this week. Thursday night, we will have a joint Ascension Day service uh, that, that you will be able to watch. Uh, we recorded it today, and we'll have that available for you. Uh, a joint service with White Creek and Jonesville. That'll be Thursday night. Uh, I'll make sure to email out the link, and it'll also be available on our Facebook page so that we can join together uh, as our three churches here uh, to really celebrate that great festival of the Ascension. So be on the lookout for that this Thursday, uh, a special joint Ascension Day service that will be available online for you. Now with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and we'll, we'll say a word of prayer and we'll get into our study here. Uh, and yeah, and Pastor Eamon, thank you so much. You're right, hymn 539. That's the number there for you for the study tomorrow, 539. Thank you for that. So let's say a word of prayer here and we'll get started. We pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, Without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word, that by due diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so we'll begin here. Uh, as I said, we're going to be talking about uh, the book of Titus and reading through that. But before we get into the actual text, I wanted to do a kind of a brief introduction for you as far as, as the book goes and as far as Titus himself will go. So the book of Titus is one of those epistles, one of those letters uh, from St. Paul. So St. Paul writes this letter to Titus, and we'll see that in the opening verses here, uh, to give him encouragement uh, as he is serving in the church in Crete. Now, Crete is... Uh, if you know your geography at all, is this island off the southern edge of Greece. And so, uh, you know, we, we kind of have that in mind as you were thinking about this, that there's Titus in Crete uh, on this island south of Greece in a very Greek area. Uh, and there's certainly going to be some influences there as well as we kind of dig our way through the book here. Now, a couple things here to talk about as far as Titus is concerned before we actually get into the book. Titus is mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. There's uh, about 12 or so mentions of Titus uh, within the New Testament. A lot of those occur in the book of 2 Corinthians. And what we kind of learn there about Titus is that he wasn't always in Crete. Uh, there seems to be some connection between him and the Corinthians. Uh, Paul makes mention of when Titus was with you. And so we see there, uh, as Titus gets mentioned in 2 Corinthians, that he had served the, the Corinthians. He had brought the word of God to them. Uh, he had served them as a pastor in, in some capacity as he was with them. And some scholars uh, actually even will take some of these references and, and they kind of think, uh, as you look through that, that perhaps it was Titus who delivered that letter, uh, the second Corinthians letter, to the church. Uh, kind of an interesting connection there. But Paul makes some references there to Titus serving faithfully uh, in that Corinthian congregation, and even bringing him good news 
of what was going on there. So that was the that's kind of the first place we see Titus show up. Uh, and then the second place we see him is in the book of Galatians. That there in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, Titus shows up and Paul makes kind of two notes that, that you might want to have in mind as we hear about, uh, as we read through this uh, letter here starting today. First off, Paul mentions that he actually takes Titus with him to Jerusalem. Now, uh, it's quite possible that this trip to Jerusalem is when Paul went there to be part of the council. Uh, and at that council, what was discussed was whether or not the gospel should be going out to the Gentiles and whether or not the Gentiles had to be circumcised and follow all of the Jewish laws as they received the gospel. This is all recounted in the book of Acts for you. And so it's quite possible that's the trip he's referring to. It might have been another trip to Jerusalem as well. And yet we see that Titus uh, is obviously very close to St. Paul uh, in that he is making that journey with him from Greece to uh, Jerusalem, to the Holy Land, to be with the apostles. Now, the other thing we see in that Galatians reference, Galatians chapter 2, is Titus was not circumcised. Now, this is an important point, especially as we'll hear it a little bit in our book, uh, in our reading here today, that Titus uh, is a Greek. He is not a Jew by birth or by nationality. Uh, he is Greek. He's a Gentile through and through. So, of course, as a child, he would not have been circumcised. But the question arose, as I kind of mentioned with that council, well, does an unbeliever or does a, a Greek, a non-Jew, when they become a believer... Do they have to be circumcised? Well, Titus is one example where Paul said, no, the circumcision does not make you a Christian. Circumcision is not a requirement to become a Christian. And this really was kind of the test case to really say, no, you do not have to follow all the old Jewish laws, the old Jewish customs, that the Old Testament uh, is fulfilled in Christ. And so it's a very important point that is mentioned there as far as Titus. And Titus is kind of that, that one great example in the New Testament of how circumcision is not a requirement. It's not a law for us in order to be a Christian. And so Titus plays a very important role in that way. Now there's one final place then where Titus is mentioned in the New Testament outside of this book. And that is in 2 Timothy. Uh, as Paul is going through towards the end of that letter in chapter 4, he mentions Titus and how Titus is going to yet another area to bring the gospel uh, to the people in Greece. And so we can see as we look through all these kind of different references to Titus, we see that he plays a fairly important role in the early church. Uh, not only is he uh, quite possibly a letter carrier, uh, carrying scripture, to the uh, Corinthian congregation, uh, but also he is uh, one of those central figures in showing that the gospel is for all people, right? It goes out to all nations, even the Gentiles. Uh, and then finally, we see that he falls in the line uh, of, of all the pastors, all those men whom the Lord has sent forth to carry that gospel into the world, to, to serve faithfully uh, by preaching the word and administering the sacraments. And so Titus is a very important figure in the New Testament, uh, even uh, as we see here in the book that bears his name. And now one final note uh, as we kind of wrap up our introduction here uh, is to get uh, kind of some history here for you before we dive into it. And now the book of Titus is actually written uh, about the year 68 AD, which is going to be uh, rather important because in the year 70 AD, that's the year when the Romans will sack Jerusalem, they'll destroy the temple, uh, and the Jews kind of get scattered. So uh, this letter is just a few years before this happened, but it's also before the island of Crete is also kind of taken over by the Romans. And so th there's some, a little bit of historical importance to that as well. Uh, not, not too much that will affect our understanding, but just something to be aware of, kind of the placement of this book in history. Now, as we actually get into the book, let me lay before you three kind of themes or ideas uh, or, or, or kind of uh, important aspects of the book 
that, that would be good to kind of have in your mind as we start reading the text here. Because really, uh, as Paul will write this letter, there are a couple things that are going to keep coming up and that'll be good to kind of have your ears perked up for, to, to listen for those things as we come upon them. Now, one of the first things, and, and this one really goes throughout the entire book, is Paul is going to be really speaking quite a bit about good works. And specifically, how good works are done by believers. And what we learn as we, as we go through this book and notice all the references to good works is that Paul never separates good works from faith, but he always puts them in their proper place. He says he will always speak of faith coming first and then good works flowing out from that. Right, Because it's, it's very easy for us to get it mixed up the other way and to think we have to do good works in order to be of the faith. Right, The good works somehow make us good. Well, no, in this book, as throughout all of Scripture, we're going to see it's the other way. Faith comes first, and then good works flow out from that. That's a very important aspect of this book. Now, another thing that will be big throughout this book is the idea of sound doctrine. That Paul will bring this up time and time again. That we are to stand in the sound doctrine. We are not to give in to the false teachers. And in fact, uh, that we are to call out false teaching whenever it occurs. Uh, that we are to stand on the truth of God's word no matter what. That's a very important point that will be we really woven throughout this entire book. And then finally, one, one last part. And this kind of compromises the middle half or so, or even some of the beginning of the book, is that Paul in this letter will kind of lay out uh, all the roles that different vocations have. So he'll talk about what should pastors do, what should men do, what are women called to do, what are children called to do. And we see that this is a, a common theme that even Martin Luther picks up in the small catechism when he includes a table of duties. What are we to do, right? What are we to do in our life as Christians uh, to serve our neighbor? And so that's one final aspect here of this book, one final theme, if you will, to kind of keep your ears out for, to, to listen for that, how uh, all these different roles of our vocations will be explained uh, and will be kind of laid out for us. And we're going to get some of that here today as we dive into chapter one. So with that, I think that's a pretty good introduction to the book for you. Uh, if there's any questions or comments on that, feel free to uh, leave a comment there. I've seen a bunch of comments, uh, people watching today. So thank you so much for joining us. But any questions or comments along the way, feel free to leave those there in the comment section. And I'll uh, bring those up and answer those as we go along. But without any further ado, let's dive into Titus chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 to 4 to start off. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And we'll stop it right there. So as is very customary, re remember these epistles are letters. So as is very customary in these epistles, Paul begins with kind of a salutation, a greeting, if you will. So he identifies that he is the one writing this letter, uh, that these words are coming from him, right? So Paul, he starts off. So there is no doubt here who the author of the book is. It, it does come from St. Paul. But then what Paul does next is kind of uh, really an interesting thing where he, he lays out almost his qualifications, right? Who is he? Well, we, we oftentimes would think he would start off by saying, I'm an apostle, right? I'm called by the Lord. Well, he'll get there. But in this epistle, that's not where he starts. Now, interestingly enough, he starts off by saying, Paul, a servant of God. And in fact, that word servant there uh, really means a slave. 
And as we see, Paul will describe himself this way in many places in the New Testament. But what's he showing by saying that? By saying he's a servant of God, a slave of God? Well, he's showing that God uh, is his master and that what he is doing, what he's writing, what he's teaching is not from himself, not for himself, but it is from God and it's for God. It's for God's glory. And so he does this. He writes this letter. He gives these instructions not to puff himself up, but because he's been sent by God, because he, he is doing the will of God and bringing forth God's word, uh, even as he writes it to Titus. Now, this is, I mean, an incredible thing for us to kind of consider that even for you and me, right, for every single one of us, we can say the same thing. We are a servant of God, that we, we don't exist to try to puff ourselves up and make ourselves better, but we exist to glorify our Father, that we exist to glorify the God who created us and redeemed us, saved us, uh, that we really, uh, throughout our lives, we give glory to God alone. And so Paul starts it right there. But then kind of flowing right out from this, he gets to an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a good time again to, to kind of touch on what does it mean? What does the word apostle mean? You know, this is sometimes a little fuzzy area for people. Well, what's the distinction between a disciple and an apostle? Well, a disciple, uh, especially as we draw it from the Greek word uh, for disciple, is one who learns. Right? A disciple follows a teacher, follows a rabbi, and learns. That's what a disciple does. He kind of soaks it all up. But then an apostle, again, kind of learning from the Greek here, is one who is sent out. And that's what the word apostle means, to be sent out. And so when he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, it means he is one who has been sent out by Jesus. One who is sent to carry that word to all these places that the Lord will send him. And so uh, that's, a kind of, again, a distinction to keep in your mind here that Paul, what's he saying? Well, he has a call from the Lord that the Lord has issued this call to him, even appearing to him on the road uh, and, and revealing his glory to him. And the Lord has sent him out to carry the word of God out into the world. And so as Paul gives these two kind of uh, qualifiers for himself or descriptions of himself, he's showing Titus and you and me what's going on in this letter. Well, it's coming from God. Remember, he is God's servant. But it's also coming from the command of God because he is sent out. He is an apostle of Christ Jesus. So very important uh, not to skip over those titles, but to really understand what's going on as Paul calls himself these two things. And so then, kind of having this in mind, he gives the reason, right? Why is he sent out? Why is he serving God in this way? Well, he says it's for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. So in other words, when Paul writes these words, when he proclaims the word of God, it is so that the, the faith of the elect might be strengthened and that they might stand in the knowledge of the truth. Again, these are important themes that will be seen throughout the book, uh, that only the word of God brings truth and that the word of God is the thing which creates faith, which sustains faith, and which moves faith to good works. And so even as Paul is writing this letter, he is saying right off the bat, why? Why am I writing this letter? Well, it's for you, right? It's for you and me and, and for everyone who is elect, who is chosen by God uh, and who, has, who is saved. That it is for our faith, for our knowledge of the truth. Uh, and that's really a comforting thing as you get into this book. And it reminds us again, what is one of the primary functions of Holy Scripture? Well, it is to build up the elect, right? To, to strengthen the faith of the believers. Now, certainly, Scripture can convert an unbeliever. And yet, Scripture, in one of its primary roles, is meant for the believer to read, to hear, and to grow as they hear the word of God. And so as Paul lays that out there, he, he sa says all of this, that it's for our faith and for our knowledge. And he says it accords with godliness. This is 
kind of where the good works idea comes in. As our faith is strengthened, well, then all of this accords to godliness. It leads to godliness, which means it leads to godly actions. It leads to acting uh, as if we were not the same as an unbeliever, that, that instead we are ones redeemed by the Lord. And so we see again that kind of proper distinction, that proper order starts with faith and it moves to good works. And then as he kind of moves then into, into verse two, he gives this reminder again that we have the hope of eternal life, uh, that always everything we do, we do because we know that life on this earth is not the end. That instead, we have a life that will never end. Our bodies should be killed, even if they want to try to destroy us here on this world, while well, our life never ends. And that fundamentally changes how we act, how we see the world, and what, we're what we are willing to do, what we're willing to put up with. And so, as he says, we have that hope of eternal life. And he reminds us that that hope, that eternal life, is a promise from God. And there's two qualifications he'll put in here. That it's a promise from God. One, he says, God who never lies. And we see that a lot in the Psalms, that every word of God is true, for instance. So God never lies. That means take any word of scripture, God's not lying to you. Never has, never will. And so we always stand on that. And so as he mentions that, he gives this interesting little nugget uh, that it was this eternal life that God promised before the ages began. Now, to see this a little bit further, there's uh, two passages in particular to kind of keep in mind here. One is the passage from Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, which speaks about uh, that our names are in the book of life since the foundation of the world. And the other one is in Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 4, which again uh, will speak about that same kind of idea that the salvation which God knew about before creation began. And so as he says here, that hope of eternal life we have, well, it was ours even before creation, which is just an amazing thing for us to consider. That even before God created the world, even before anything came into existence. God knew how he would save us. God knew how he would give us eternal life. And so that part was never in question. That part was never in doubt. We knew for sure that we would have eternal life because God had planned it out. God knew it all beforehand and he gave us that promise even before Adam and Eve had come into existence. And that's such a wonderful and comforting thought for us. That especially, you know, as you go through crazy times, like we're going through right now, we know that our salvation, our eternal life is sure and certain. Because God isn't sitting there going, uh-oh, I hadn't seen this part coming. No, instead, even before creation began, God is there and he knows how this eternal life will come about. How it is that you and I will be saved for all eternity. And so it, Paul is giving this really great promise uh, and showing uh, from, really from the, the sending of the Lord that this is how we're anchored. This is a promise that is ours through faith. And so as he keeps going here with verse three, uh, as he's mentioning all of this, the faith, the good works, the eternal life, he says, now at the proper time, all of this was manifested. And notice how. How is this manifested? How is this made known to us or revealed to us? Well, he says, through the preaching. Through the preaching. Now, this is remarkable. This is something that other religions just, they, they don't understand. They, they, they think completely differently. But the Christian faith, right, and Christ himself, comes through the preached word. It comes through the word of God because Christ is the word of God. And so the preaching uh, is how the faith is given. And yet the preaching, when you hear that, don't think just, oh, when pastor gets up in the pulpit and gives a sermon. No, that, that's not it. That, that's kind of too narrow a focus. Instead, the preaching is wherever the word of God is. So that is in the sermon, 
That's also in the liturgy. As every word of our worship comes from the word of God. But it's also in the sacraments where the word is attached to water and the word is attached to bread and wine. All of these are that preaching. And so it, when he says all of this is made known through the preaching, it is made known through anything, anything at all where the word of God is. Anytime the word of God is proclaimed, whether it's a sermon or the liturgy or the sacraments, you name it, there is salvation being made known to you. And so what a remarkable thing that is to see that, to, to understand that, that this is made known through preaching, through the word of God, in other words. But then he gives one kind of final little nugget here in his introduction. He says, it's the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. So in other words, it's not the preaching of a man. It's not that Paul was preaching his own thing and every other pastor is preaching his own thing. No, it's the preaching that is done by and through the command of Jesus Christ. You know, and this is, again, such a, a key thing to keep in mind that, yes, every pastor has his own kind of style. Every pastor has his own uh, kind of way of putting things. And that's one of the amazing to see how God uses men uh, in this way, uses their personalities, uses who they are. And yet, every pastor does not preach his own word, but the word of God. And, and the way Paul puts it is that he is entrusted with this. That in other words, as he is sent out by the Lord, he has been entrusted to preach the word of God, not to preach his own thoughts or ideas. And that same thing carries even today. That every pastor you will ever meet is entrusted to preach the word of God. Not to preach their opinions, not to preach their thoughts, but to preach the true word of God. And that should give all of us the utmost confidence, the utmost comfort to know that it is the word of God that is coming to us. And as Paul says, it's done by the command of Christ, which means it's done by the authority of Christ. Because where the word is, there is Christ, there is salvation. Now file one thing away here before we kind of finish off the introduction section where he says that it's entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Okay, God our Savior. Just hang on to that for just like two more verses and we'll get to where there's really a good connection here. But God our Savior. So now as Paul kind of ends this section where he's talking about who he is, why he's writing, now we get the recipient, right? To Titus, my true child in a common faith. And here we get this imagery again uh, of a father to a son. That the, What is the faith? Well, it, it gives us a family relationship. A father to a son uh, as Paul taught Titus, but also brothers and sisters as we'll see in other places here as well. That we are one, not because our blood is the same, but because our faith is the same. As he says, in a common faith, that we are truly brothers and sisters, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters in Christ, because we share this one faith. We share the faith of God that he creates in us. And that even though we are separated by years and, or distance or whatever it might be, we share this one same faith, which makes us all united in Jesus Christ. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, imagine hearing that as, as, as if you're Titus, and even as you hear it today, that we are uh, children. We are brothers and sisters through this faith. And then Paul ends this kind of introduction section with that famous greeting, grace and peace, right? Grace, that which we do not deserve, and peace, right? That that reconciliation between God and man that comes through Jesus Christ. And then he ends it with this, from God the Father, okay, just like normal, we, we see that, God the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Now I asked you to hang on to that uh, last part from just a few verses ago, but now let's put those two together. He says, by the command, at the end of verse three, by the command of God, our Savior, and now he says, and Christ 
our Savior. Now, this is a subtle thing, but it's huge. Notice what he's done. He has just equated Jesus Christ with God. Now, for, for those of you who are listening going, I don't get it, right? Good. That's not a bad problem. Uh, that, that It's not a problem for us. We get it. We know Jesus Christ is God. And yet there are people out there in the world, even today, who will try to tell you, no, the Bible never calls Jesus God, right? Son of God, sure, but they never actually call him God. Well, here is one example. There's others that are more clear, but here is one example where we actually see it happen. God, our Savior, and right down there in the next verse, Christ Jesus, our Savior. Just use those interchangeably. They're the same person. Christ Jesus is God. God is Christ Jesus. They are both uh, one and the same, right? Jesus is God. Because that little part, our Savior at the end, shows us that we, we that those two really are the same. It's kind of like a, a giant equal sign there. So I wanted to point that out. Just one example, again, among many, but one example of where Scripture really does clearly say that Jesus Christ is God. Now, that's the introduction. Uh, those are just the first four verses, uh, but very important to see how Paul is kind of laying the groundwork for the rest of the book uh, and really giving us some comfort even at the very beginning and focusing us on Christ uh, as every letter will do, as every word of scripture will do. And so, having that introduction done, let's go ahead and continue on here with verses 5 through 9. And if there's any questions at all at this time or, or at any point, feel free to put those on uh, the comment section and we'll bring those up. Uh, but not seeing any right now, let's read verses 5 through 9 here. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And we'll stop it right there. And so as we get past this introduction, the first thing that we see uh, is the reason why Paul, one of the reasons at least, why Paul is writing. As he says, I left you in Crete. Right, that this little island on the south side uh, of the of the nation of Greece, he, I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order. This is a very, very important thing uh, for the church uh, then as it is now. Order uh, that the church is not a bunch of chaos. That God is not a god of chaos, but God is a god of order. Look how he's ordered creation. Look how he has put together the church in this order. And so what is Paul kind of reminding him and, and in a way kind of pulling back the curtain for us? Well, he's showing us that in, the, in this nation, this island of Crete, there was disorder and that's not good. That it is good for there to be order in the church. And as we're going to see here, the order starts with pastors, uh, getting pastors put into place in a good order. Now, this is very important, and this is something even today you know, that our church does a fantastic job with, uh, that pastors are not kind of free agents, if you will, to kind of go wherever they want, whenever they want. No, a pastor only can work, can only uh, do his job, if you will, can only preach the word and administer the sacraments as we confess, if he has a rightly ordered call. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I have, the call, I have a call to serve you here at St. Peter. And, and so this is where I serve. Uh, and so this is the way our church uh, has put the order together, drawing it from the scripture, seeing that this is how God has put it together, has ordained it, that there is this 
order, and it starts with pastors. Uh, they have calls to specific locations to serve specific people. And so as, as we get this kind of idea right at the beginning of the book, it's very important to keep in mind because as it starts in the church, as order is maintained there, that order also goes out into our daily lives. That's kind of how Paul is going to organize this book. And so we started off here, as I said, with pastors. Now, you might be wondering, where are you getting pastors from? It didn't say pastors in here anywhere. Well, this is where we have to understand the terminology that Scripture uses to speak about pastors. And you see that there in verse 5. Right after that comment about order, we get and appoint elders in every town. Now, if you go down to verse 7, you'll see another word, for an overseer. Now, these are two words that are speaking really about the same office. Elders, overseers, bishops, presbyters, however your Bible might put it, these are all kind of different words that Scripture uses for what we call today pastors. Okay, so, so don't think when you hear elders here, we're not talking board of elders, we're talking about pastors. That was the way that a pastor, or that was the term that was used for a pastor in scripture and in the early church. Uh, and so kind of keep that in mind, that this, as we go through, these are qualifications for pastors. What, what does a pastor need to be? Or who does he need to be? What does he need to do? And so as he says, appoint these elders, appoint these pastors in every town as I directed you. And here we see that idea too, that pastors go out to where the people are, uh, that this is what a pastor does. It's not that people come to the pastor, like, like the pastor sets up a church and people come, but no, it's the other way. A pastor goes to where the people are. And so, as I mentioned, we see this even in our call process today, that a church will call a pastor and the pastor will go. Uh, and so you kind of see that here, kind of hinted at, as Paul will describe it. But now as we kind of get into verse 6, as I said, we're getting these qualifications for pastors. Uh, what kind of a person does a pastor need to be? And so as we start off, the first thing that's mentioned is uh, if anyone is above reproach. In other words, that he is not embroiled in sin, that you can't look at him and go, wow, what a terrible person. Right, look at all this gross outward sin that he is doing uh, and, and really that is bringing down the, the prestige of the office, that, that is sullying the name of the church and of Christ. And so we see that is kind of step one, uh, that a pastor should not be uh, kind of this gross outward sinner who is not repentant, who is doing these evil things throughout the world because this really does harm the church. Now, the next thing we get, the husband of one wife. And here, uh, much can be said. We'll, we'll keep it somewhat simple here for the day. Uh, but the first thing we see is uh, one kind of touch, well, one point to touch on. The husband of one wife shows us that a pastor is to be a man. Uh, that this is not something that's popular to say in our world today, but it is what scripture very clearly teaches here and elsewhere. That men are, our pastors. It is simply an office that is not given to women. Now, there's a bunch of reasons for this. Again, uh, we won't go into full detail on it now, but one of the biggest reasons why, other than God specifically giving it to men, which is pretty obvious, uh, but also because this is a picture of Christ and his church. The pastor stands in the stead of Christ. And so, we do make a confession whenever we put someone into that office uh, that we are making a confession of the really the humanity of Jesus, that he was and is a man, uh, that he, he is that gender, that sex, that that is who he is. And so even in the pastoral office, we don't open it up to men and women, but to men as a confession of the humanity of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then when we kind of extend that out, when you have a pastor serving the congregation as uh, in the stead of Christ, what also helps us to see that we as a church, and this would include your pastor, by the way, 
are the bride of Christ. That we are the woman receiving from Christ every good thing. And then responding in love toward him in this perfect marriage. And so, uh, as I said, we can go much deeper into this. But this is one example uh, where scripture does show us pastors are to be men. It is simply an office that a woman cannot hold. Uh, that this is the way God has ordained it, has established it uh, in this good order. To always, again, this is the biggest point, to always confess Jesus Christ and who he is, that he became a man. Not just that he became a human being, but he became a man. A, a very important thing for us to really kind of grab hold of here. And so kind of that, that's one point here on this phrase, but the other one is the, the husband of one wife, that one of the easy ways uh, for a, a man, but anybody really at all, to, to fall into gross outward sins is through these sins. And so here, uh, the qualification for a pastor is, don't let that happen. Have your wife uh, and, and enjoy the gifts that God gives within marriage. That, that a pastor should not be going beyond the bounds of marriage uh, in, in such a public way. Instead, he is to be married to one wife, even as Christ is married to the church. As all marriages are a confession of that reality, of the true marriage of Christ to his church. And so, uh, as I said, way more can be said on that uh, and, and more time to talk about that later. But hopefully that kind of touches on the key points of that aspect of it for you. And then as, as we kind of move on to the next part, as he talks about that, then he brings up children. Uh, and he says that the children of the pastor are to be believers and not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination. Now, again, do not misunderstand uh, what, what is being said here. It's not to say if a pastor has a child who grows up and falls away from the faith, he can't be a pastor anymore. No, th that's not it. Because to understand this verse that way, to, to think about it that way, is to make the faith of children dependent on the, the parents, right? But that's not where faith comes from. Faith comes from the Lord. Only God can create and sustain faith. And yet, what should a man who is a pastor do with his children? Well, as Paul is saying here, he should teach them, right? He should raise them in the faith. That if you had a pastor who never brought his kids to church, uh, never read the catechism to them, never talked to them about Christ, well, that should be a red flag, right? And that should be something uh, that, that really should be brought up. And it's not to say that if a child falls away, somehow the, the pastor now loses his eligibility, if you will. No, 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 not at all. Instead, it is to say the pastor should be leading by example, teaching his children the faith, growing them in that way, bringing them to church and, and Bible study and, and doing these things at home as well, that this is what a pastor should be doing. And uh, to kind of take that next step, uh, that when, uh, you know, that his children should not be those kind of men that we say pastors shouldn't be either, right? That he should not be encouraging them to go live in their gross outward sins, their debauchery and insubordination, Paul says. But that's true of all of us as well. All Christians uh, should be really thinking the same of their children, but especially for pastors here, right? That we are to raise up children in the ways, or in the faith, right? In the church uh, to always place Christ before their eyes. And so then, as we get to verse 7, we're going to get more qualifications. But those are the big ones, right? Those are the ones right off the bat that Paul wants to lay before us. And so now, as, uh, as we get to verse 7, we see that second term, the overseer, right? The one who is looking over the church. This is kind of where we get that term pastor from, right? A pastor means shepherd, one who watches over the flock, right? So an overseer. Well, he is God's steward, it says. In other words, what does a pastor do? Well, he keeps, again, it keeps watch over the things of God. That a pastor is not to kind of come up with his own new and unique ways of doing things. No, instead he is to guard what God has given, not only to him, but to the church. 
He is to guard the word and guard the sacraments and, and give them out rightly and faithfully. And so we see that again, that how should a pastor view his office and, and how should you, right, as a Christian, view the pastoral office? Well, not that the man is doing what, he, you know, kind of his things, but as the man guarding the things of God, as the man trying to be as faithful as he can in giving out the Lord's word and his sacraments in exactly the way that God ordains it, not the way that men and women think it should be done. And so we get the, after this steward part, we get the refrain brought up again that you must be above reproach. And now we get this kind of list for the rest of verse seven. You shouldn't be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. We're kind of seeing the Ten Commandments being played out here. That what should he not be? Well, he should not be a gross outward sinner. Because, again, when we hear this list, it's not to say that a pastor is always going to be this perfect person. No, but when a pastor messes up, well, he must be above reproach. He must repent of his sins. But there's also something to be said here as you go through this, that a pastor should learn uh, to kind of follow Christ, right? To live that life of good works that flows out from his faith. That all of us, that as we grow, as we continue on the faith, that we, we continue to grow in these ways as well. Never perfectly. We will never get there in this life. And yet, we strive ever more to not be arrogant, to not be quick-tempered or, or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Uh, that instead, we strive always to serve our neighbor and to love them. And when we fail, we repent and we turn back to the Lord. We ask for forgiveness and then we strap up, you know, kind of pick ourselves up again as Christ brings us that forgiveness and we get back to work. We continue doing what the Lord sends us to do. And so as he kind of ends that part, right, these are all kind of the, the knots, right? Don't do these things. You're, as a pastor, you should not do this. But now here's kind of the what should you do? What are the good things? Well, verse 8, be hospitable, right? Uh, take care of one another. Be a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Well, again, all things that we strive for, all things that all of us, but especially pastors, Strive to do at all times. Will we be perfect? By no means. But when we fall short, do we repent? Absolutely. As we all do. And so as he lays out this list, it is just a reminder that as a pastor, a pastor is called to live this life of faith and to be an example to all the church of what godly living looks like. And ultimately, what does godly living look like? Well, it looks like loving the Lord and loving our neighbor and repenting when we fall short, repenting when we mess up, when we do sin. That, that is really ultimately the qualifications for a pastor. Now, as he kind of gets through those things and we get to verse nine, then we get kind of this last little bit, right? This last thing. And uh, as we've gone through all these qualifications, this one kind of stands up at the end as very important. He must hold firm, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Now, there's a lot we can unpack here, but, but let's keep it somewhat simple to, to start it out. You must hold firm to the word. That a pastor is going to have different personality quirks, right? Some pastors uh, might be angrier than others. Uh, some pastors might be this more than another. But one thing that all pastors must do is hold firm to the word. To not let uh, their personality, their thoughts, their opinions trump the word of God. That ultimately, uh, if a pastor is to be a good pastor, is to be faithful, he holds on to that word. Now, an important little note here at the end, though, that you don't want to lose sight of, is as he says this, that, that a pastor should hold firm to that trustworthy word, that it's the trustworthy word that is taught. That this is not something that a pastor is kind of born a pastor. No, instead a pastor is taught to be a pastor. 
This is an amazing thing, again, that, that we still hold on to as a synod, that we hear it from God's word and we stick to it. We have a very well-educated uh, clergy. We, our pastors uh, all have master's degrees, right? That this is something that we understand, that we are taught the word. It's not that you're born uh, as some sort of holy person and that makes you a pastor. No, instead, just like all people, that word of God comes to us. Uh, that word of God teaches us. And then we, we confess it, right? We say it back out. That in other words, kind of maybe kind of put this in a different perspective, that a pastor is not trying to say what is kind of his unique thought. Instead, he is taking what he has learned from God, from the word of God, and giving it back to the congregation, who then learns it and says it back, right? And it's this kind of cyclical process of hearing the word, learning it, and confessing it. That this is what a pastor must do. He must be grounded in the word of God because if he's not, then why is he a pastor, right? That, that, that is uh, the biggest disqualification in this whole list. If you don't hold to the word, then you can't truly be in that office. You can't be entrusted with the things of God. And so as he says then, right after this, after having been taught the word and, and saying this out, he says, why? Why is this so important? Well, so that he may give instruction in sound doctrine. So in other words, you must be firm in the word so that you can teach others, so that we can build one another up through the word of God. But also, he says, so we can rebuke those who contradict it. So not only does a pastor need to know the word to teach others, right? To proclaim that word to one another, but also to guard against those who would speak a different word. Uh, to be able to tell the flock that this, uh, that what you've heard over here is not right, right? What this person is screaming out is, is against the word of God. Uh, this is the job of the pastor. This is the qualification. What is he expected to do as he takes care of the flock, as he holds this office? And, and so it really, as you kind of work through this last verse there, it really comes down to, the word, having the word and standing firm in it at all times. Now, uh, seeing as how we just have a few minutes left, let's go ahead and we'll end chapter one. This kind of will, will bring it all full, full circle here. And so we'll do that by reading verses 10 to 16. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And we'll stop it right there. And so as we, we kind of got through the qualifications for a pastor... And we ended with that idea of standing firm on the word and rebuking those who preach something different. Well, now Paul is going to say kind of, all right, Titus, all right, you, right, you faithful Christians who are reading this later, why am I bringing all this up? Well, he says, because there are those in their day, just as there are in ours, who are teaching something different and are doing it in the name of God, that they come across as Christians, but they're bringing a different word. They're saying something that God has simply not said. And so as Paul gets into this, he says, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, right? And he mentions the circumcision party. Now we heard about them in the book of Philippians. Uh, and I kind of touched on this at the beginning. Uh, and this is part of why. That circumcision party 
They were ones who said, you must be circumcised. You must hold to the Jewish uh, kind of traditions in order to be a Christian, right? And so Paul is saying, look, there are many people, even ones like that, who are saying things that are not in God's word, who are, which are not from the mouth of God. And so verse 11, what does he say? They must be silenced because this is what false teaching does, as he will go on to say. It can upset families. It can rip families and churches apart because now all of a sudden those who remain faithful to the word will stand on it, but some will be pulled away. That some who are not as deeply rooted in the word of God will be deceived in this. Uh, and through no fault of their own, but through the fault of these false teachers. And so Paul is laying out, this is a very serious issue. To silence those who are preaching against the word of God, especially those who do it in the name of God, who, who come across as Christian, who want to be seen as a Christian, but are truly not preaching Christ, who are not preaching the truth. And so as he says, that what are they doing it for? They aren't doing it in order to build one another up, in order to proclaim Christ and be that overseer, that steward of the things of God. No, Paul says they are doing it for shameful gain, right? Their only goal is to get rich off of this, to get famous. Well, as we heard in, in that kind of qualifications for pastors, that's not what a pastor is to do. Uh, he is not in it for the money. He is not in it for fame. Uh, if money comes uh, as the faithful uh, respond in faith, uh, so be it, right? This is kind of that, that call for a pastor uh, to not be concerned about the money, but also for the congregation to, to support the pastor so that he doesn't turn to that shameful gain. And so Paul's kind of laying it out there. These guys, they've kind of forgotten about that and they are going for the money, for their own fame and fortune. And so he, he quotes, this is kind of one of those uh, uh, funny parts of the book, uh, as far as I'm concerned. He quotes this poet uh, who they claim to be a prophet, right? Who says, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. When you hear that, you kind of go, boy, that seems a little harsh. And yet Paul says, this testimony is true. Well, it's just kind of a funny moment here. He's saying, it's true. Look, all of you guys, you have this reputation and it holds up. Right? You're liars. You're, you're lazy. You, you, you try to lead people away from the word of God. And so what is so important? Right? For them, it was of vital importance. And for us, I think we can say the same thing in, in our country. Because really, all people, all men, no matter where they are, are liars, are deceivers, are, are uh, lazy, and try to be enemies of God. All of us are right in our sin. And so, as he says, Yet for, for those who are of the faith, for those who have the word of God, what should you do? Well, he says, rebuke them. And in fact, he says, rebuke them sharply. Now, this is something we don't always like. Uh, we, we don't, and certainly as pastors, uh, it's not a favorite thing to do. I, I, I really do not like telling someone that they're wrong, uh, telling someone that what they're doing is harmful or dangerous, uh, telling them what they might think or believe is not the word of God. I don't like doing that. I'd much rather not, right? I'd much rather be, be nice and friendly with everyone and, and kind of let people go. But that's not what I'm called to do. No, as even Paul will say here, we rebuke them sharply. That when we are straying from the path, when we stray from the word of God, we must be rebuked. We must be brought back. We must be shown our errors. It's not always easy. It's not fun, but it is necessary. And he gives us the reason why. Why do we do this, he says? Well, he says that, in order that, they may be sound in the faith. That when we stray from the pure doctrine of God, we need to be brought back. We need to have our errors made known to us in order that we may stand firm in the faith. And so as he says, right, because the problem is if this does not happen, if we say, uh, well, you're not really right, but I'm not going to say it. Well, then we just keep wandering off further and further away from Christ. Now, the example he gives in their day was going into Jewish myths, right? That thought you must uh, circumcise yourself to be a Christian or whatever it might be. 
In our day, it might be wandering off. Somebody goes off and says, well, we just have to love people and love them no matter what they're doing and, and just accept their sin, right? Because we think it sounds really nice. And we can just wander that path until we are so far away from Christ, we wonder how we got there. And so as Paul says, instead, we, we must rebuke that. We must speak out against it so that we can remain in the word of God. So we do not leave the faith and, and we do not leave Christ and where he is. And so as he gets to uh, verse 15, then he kind of uses this analogy. To the pure, all things are pure. So in other words, to the believer, right? All the words of God are true. They're right. They're pure. They're holy. But he says, to the defiled, to the unbeliever, nothing is pure. That to the unbeliever, the word of God, it just sounds evil. It sounds wrong. And so when someone says, you know, you believe that only men can be pastors, you are hateful and unloving. Well, it's because they do not listen to the word of God. And so that will never be pure in their ears. But to those of us who are of the faith, who, who trust in the word of God, who, who know that, as we said at the beginning, God never lies, right? Uh, back in verse two, I believe. Well, we hear that and we go, no, this is a wonderful thing, right? That, that only men are pastors is wonderful because it is a confession of Jesus Christ and who he is and, more, and even more who we are as his church. And so to us, that will always be pure. That will always be right because it is the word of God. But to an unbeliever, it will never make sense. It will always appear backwards to them. And so as he kind of ends here, right, as we're talking about these false teachers and the danger of false teaching, because make no mistake, false teaching, false doctrine, it is the most dangerous thing in all the world. And that's not hyperbole. It truly is the most dangerous thing to have something that is not true, to teach something that goes against God's word. And so he says, they profess, these false teachers they profess to know God. They will tell you, I'm a Christian. I come in the name of God. But he says, they deny God by their works. Now, this is where we start seeing this, right? Because he, he says, they're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. And this is where we see again that relationship. Good works do not make us a Christian. Good works do not give us faith. No, faith gives us good works. And so when you see good works, truly good works, works that aren't done with an ulterior motive, works that aren't done to make yourself look good, but works that really spring out of faith. Well, when we see that, we know that, we believe, that that person believes in God, that they are a Christian, that God has created the faith in them. But there are those who will say, I'm a Christian. And then you look at their works. And you see that everything they do is for themselves. Everything they do uh, is really tainted with sin in the worst way possible. Well, Paul says, when we see that, we know. We know that they are not a believer, that they are defiled, that they do not repent and return to the Lord. Now, is this easy? By no means, right? This is not an easy thing to be able to determine. And most of the time, we're not always going to know it. You're not always going to be able to make that kind of judgment call on the fly. And yet, we still have that ability. We can still see that in cases where someone says they are a Christian, but in everything they do, they don't act that way. They act contrary to the word of God. And when we see that, we go, hey, look, right? Even though they're trying to say things in the name of God, they are acting differently. Beware then of what they say. Beware of their message. And look to, kind of to pull it all together, look to one who strives to uphold those qualifications for a pastor. Uh, look to one who is teaching the name of God, but is also uh, the, all those things you heard earlier in chapter one, that they're hospitable and a lover of good and all this stuff. And when they aren't, they repent. Uh, they repent and they tell you they were wrong and, and, and that they acted in a bad way. There is the fruit of faith. There is the good works, right? The, the things that are good and then the good work of repentance when they fall short. 
And so as Paul kind of ends it there, uh, this is where we're going to kind of go next week. We're going to pick up right off of this with that idea of, of good works being shown forth in our life and these good works that flow from the faith, that it all starts there and then it goes out into our life. But that's where we'll go next week as we get into chapter two. But I think there, uh, there at the end of chapter one, that's a good place for us to stop here for the day. Uh, so if you do have any kind of, kind of final comments or questions on anything we've talked about here today, feel free to leave those there in the comment section. Uh, and if you're watching later, or if you think of a question later on, come on back, put the, the comments in there, and I'll do my best to come back and answer any questions that we might have later. Uh, otherwise, we'll look ahead tomorrow uh, to studying the hymn, Christ is the world's redeemer. Again, we'll do that at two o'clock tomorrow. Uh, and then Thursday, we'll end this, the Holy section of the large catechism uh, at two o'clock as well. So looking forward to those two studies with you uh, tomorrow at two and again Thursday at two. We'll see no comments or questions here. Uh, why don't we close with a word of prayer? We pray. Oh God, the giver of all that is by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us here today. And alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.